Thank you very much. And also thank you for a, a great gongyo together. I think that was historic too. I'm also happy to be able to tell you that one day early, yesterday evening, the contracts were exchanged successfully for Taplow Court. <laughs> So, so, of course, we're not in there yet, as you may know. Contracts have to be exchanged. And then uh, 28 days thereafter, uh, we are able to take possession. So 28 days thereafter from yesterday is the 7th of January. So on the 7th of January, which is a good number, isn't it? On the 7th of January, we shall take possession of the property. So that's incredible news. Right, so today, as you'll see, we're going to consider together the Go Show called Winter Always Turns Into Spring. The marvelous, wonderful title. This Go Show was written to a lady called Myoichi Ama uh, in May 1275. So Nichiren Dai Shonin was 53 years old at that time. In those days, that was quite old. Of course, I don't look upon 53 as old at all. But uh, in those days, it really was old. Uh, the average lifespan uh, was somewhere round about that age. Um, so things have changed a bit due to many things, partly, of course, modern medicine. Uh, he had been pardoned uh, and uh, had returned from Sado Island, where he'd been in exile, uh, and he returned to the mainland in March 1274. That was the previous year to when this particular Gosho was written, in May the following year, 1275. So uh, he had by that time, when he wrote this letter, as it's put, retired to Mount Minobu. I'm not so sure that that's a very good word to, 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 to translate the Japanese, uh, probably it would be better to say he had withdrawn to Mount Minobu because he certainly didn't go to Mount Minobu to retire and sit down and do nothing. Uh, his purpose in going to Mount Minobu uh, was to train his disciples for the future of Kosen Rufu and to ensure that the heritage of this law called Namyo Harengikyo continued uh, as it's put in the Lotus Sutra, for 10,000 years and on into eternity. So he was very busy throughout his period in Minobo, and so were his disciples. Uh, Myoichi Yama, uh, as you probably guess from the name, was a lady. Uh, she was related to one of the six elder priests, five of whom sadly went tight end after Nichiren Daishonin died. Uh, nevertheless, this lady was a really stout believer. She lived in Kamakura, and uh, she received several gosho, several letters from Nichiren Daishonin, uh, encouraging her. The reason he took such a great interest and concern for her was that uh, her husband died, uh, leaving her, and she was rather a frail person, she had very poor health, uh, leaving her, uh, of course, alone to look after her two children, one of whom was a son who also had very poor health. So Nichiren Daishonin was constantly concerned about her, particularly as he knew she had great faith, despite her frailty, and also uh, because her husband, who had died, was a great follower, a man of great faith who had supported Nichiren Daishonin through thick and thin in those very difficult times. Uh, in this Really, this was the reason for Nichiren Daishonin being concerned about her and writing her so often. In this particular letter, uh, he encourages her not to grieve. He's really saying to her, please understand that life is eternal. And uh, please, you know, join me. In the title, Winter Always Turns Into Spring, he points out to her that through faith in the Gonson, all sufferings, whatever their nature, can be transformed into 
happiness. So, uh, having given that short introduction, I'll ask Joe to read the Gosha right through. If the sun and moon were not in the heavens, how could plants grow? Children usually have both father and mother, and it is difficult for them if one parent is dead. Your husband had to leave behind a daughter, a son who is ill, and you, his wife, who suffer from a poor constitution. To whom could he entrust his family before leaving this world? At the end of his life, the Lord Buddha lamented, How, Now I am about to enter Nirvana. The only thing troubling my heart is King Ajatashatru. Bodhisattva Kashyapa then asked him, Since the Buddha's mercy is impartial, your regret in dying should stem from compassion for all mankind. Why do you single out King Ajatashatru? The Buddha replied, Suppose that a couple has seven children, one of whom falls ill. Although the parents love all their children equally, they worry most about the sick child. Chen Tai cited this passage in his Makashikan. To the Buddha, all people are his children. <coughs> Just like parents who worry most about their sick child, among all people, the Buddha is most concerned about a man evil enough to slay his own parents and become an enemy of the Buddha's teachings. King Ajatashatru was the ruler of Magadha. He murdered his father, King Bimisara, a powerful patron of Shakyamuni, and became an enemy of the Buddha. In consequence, the heavens forsook him. The sun and moon rose out of rhythm, and the earth shook violently, as if to cast him off. All his subjects came to oppose Buddhism, and the neighboring kingdoms started to attack Magadha. All this happened because King Ajatashatru took the wicked Devadatta for his teacher. Finally, on the fifteenth day of the second month, leprous sores broke out all over his body, and he was foretold that he would die and fall into the hell of incessant suffering on the seventh day of the third month. Saddened by this, the Buddha was reluctant to enter Nirvana. He lamented, If I can but save King Ajatashatru, all other wicked people can also be saved. Your late husband had to leave behind his daughter and ailing son. It must have troubled him deeply that his aged wife, as feeble as a withered tree, should be left alone to worry about her children. The persecutions which befell Nichiren must also have weighed heavily on his heart. Since the Buddha's words are in no way false, the Lotus Sutra is certain to spread. Knowing this, your husband must have felt that something wonderful would happen, and this priest would one day be highly respected. When I was exiled, he must have wondered how the Lotus Sutra and the Jurasetsu could possibly have allowed it to happen. Were he still living, how joyful he would be to see Nichiren pardoned. How glad he would be to see my predictions fulfilled now that the Mongol Empire has attacked Japan and the country is in crisis. Such are the feelings of common mortals. Those who believe in the Lotus Sutra are as are as if in winter, which never fails to turn into spring. Never have I heard or seen of winter turning into autumn, nor have I ever heard of any believer in the Lotus Sutra who remained a common mortal. A passage from the Sutra reads, Among those who hear of this law, there is not one who shall not attain Buddhahood. Your husband gave his life for the Lotus Sutra. His entire livelihood depended on a small thief, and that was confiscated because of his faith. Surely that equaled giving his life for the Lotus Sutra. Sesson Doji offered his life for only but half a stanza of a Buddhist teaching, and Bodhisattva Yakyo burned his elbows in offering to the Buddha. They were both saints, so they could endure these austerities as easily as water pours on fire. But your husband was a common mortal. So he was at the mercy of his sufferings, like paper placed in fire. Therefore, he will certainly receive blessings as great as theirs. He may be watching his wife and children in the mirrors of the sun and the moon every moment of the day and night. 
Since you and your children are common mortals, you cannot see or hear him. But neither can the deaf hear, deaf hear thunder, nor the blind see the sun. But do not doubt that he is close at hand protecting you. Just when I was thinking that, that if at all possible I must somehow go and see you, you had a robe sent here to me. Your thoughtfulness was totally unexpected. Since the Lotus Sutra is the noblest of all sutras, I may yet gain influence in this lifetime. If so, rest assured that I will watch over your children, whether you are living then or not. While I was in Sado, and during my stay here, you sent your servant to help me. Neither in this nor future lifetime shall I ever forget what you have done for me. I will not fail to repay my debt of gratitude to you. Namyo Horengeko, Namyo Horengeko, with my deep respect, Nichiren. Thank you very much. So this wonderful title, Winter Always Turns Into Spring, which we know so well, and which indeed encourages us so often, uh, is worth considering uh, a bit more deeply. Just to read that uh, paragraph where this saying appears, those who believe in the Lotus Sutra are as if in winter, which never fails to turn into spring. And then uh, Nichiren Daishonin, with his little warm sense of humor, says, never have I seen or heard of winter turning into autumn. So on the Gohonzon, you can see two Sanskrit characters. In case anyone doesn't know them, they're halfway down on the extreme right and left of the Gohonzon. And they look rather like long, what used to be called, pin men. Right? You've got them halfway down on either side. So the one on the left, as you look at the Gohonzon, on the left, as you look at the Gohonzon, means uh, or represents transforming uh, desires into enlightenment. And the one on the right, as you look at the Gohonzon, which is the one we're concerned with today, uh, represents the principle of transforming the sufferings of this world into nirvana. Transforming sufferings into nirvana. In Japanese, it's called Shoji Soku Nehan. Shoji Soku Nehan. Soku means the same as or equals. Not a very good or a very academic translation, but for tonight it'll do. Some of you may have read an article in the UK Express recently about the word soku and the depths of its meaning. So it's two or three lectures in itself, that one character. Uh, shoji is sufferings and nehan is nirvana. Sufferings equals nirvana. So sufferings means, strictly speaking in Buddhism, the eternal sufferings of birth into this trouble-filled world, the inevitability of old age, sickness and death. Birth, old age, sickness and death. And you remember that in Shakyamuni's life, this was what caused him to go out and seek enlightenment, to discover why human beings in this world had to go through such sufferings. I think it's important to be clear about the word nirvana because uh, it can be very confused in the teachings of many sects of Buddhism. Nirvana actually means enlightenment. Its literal meaning is actually blown out, which sounds very strange, blown out. In other words, uh, its literal meaning is blown out. All earthly desires are extinguished, like a candle being blown out. It also meant, in the early Buddhism called Hinayana, uh, or it was thought to mean, 
that it was the extinguishing of the cycle of birth and death that somehow or other you got out of that cycle or you were blown out of it through, uh, of course, the most difficult series of practices and keeping of the precepts over many lifetimes. However, Mahayana uh, had what is in fact a profounder view. Mahayana Buddhism realized that Nirvana did not mean that total extinguishing or ridding oneself of the cycle of birth and death, but actually, uh, rather than being an exit from the phenomenal world, this world, uh, was an awakening to the true nature of this phenomenal world, enlightenment in other words, to the true nature of life and the true nature of death and therefore man's place in this phenomenal world or if you like man's place in the universe. This is the meaning uh, uh, in Mahayana Buddhism which is much refined as you see and much deeper and it is the meaning in Nishin Daishonin's Buddhism. So rather than being an escape from this world, it is enlightenment in the midst of this mundane world, as it's often put. So in any case, so far as the Gohonzon is concerned, of course, down the center we have the great characters Nam Myo Ho Renge Kyo, literally. In other words, all the other characters, including the two Sanskrit characters, and in particular tonight, the character for transforming uh, sufferings into nirvana, are overshadowed by nam myoho renge kyo or if you like, in the light of, bathed in the light of nam myoho renge kyo So it is nam myoho renge kyo of course, which has the power to bring about this transformation. So very simply, this character, Sanskrit character, uh, is telling us that if we chant nam myoho renge kyo to this Gahonsen, then all sufferings, whatever they may be, can be transfer, trans, uh, transformed into enlightenment, or, to put it more simply, happiness, no matter what the problem. So, from that you can gather quite clearly whatever one may say or think to oneself when one is in the midst of sufferings and difficulties. The fact is that in Nichiren Daishonin's Buddhism, there is no stalemate. There is no such thing as deadlock. There is absolutely no such thing. Sometimes we're, when we're in the depths of some great struggle, this is difficult to believe. But nevertheless, we prove it to be true, provided we stick it out. Isn't that so? Sometimes, when we're practicing to the Gohonzon, or in my experience anyway, it's like a sort of life-saving rope that someone's thrown to you in a heavy sea and you're battling to try and reach the ship that can save your life and all you can do is to hang on to this rope like grim death, isn't it? Just hang on to it. Just, in other words, keep practicing and somehow or other, no matter what, you'll get through that heavy sea. That's what it's often seemed like to me. Or another way of describing it, these, these times of difficulties, is that everything seems so dark and heavy and in a way miserable, yet somehow or other there's always a, a glimmer of light at the end of the tunnel. Somehow or other, if we keep practicing, we feel we're going to get there. Of course our minds are saying, when, when, when? Why, why, why have I got to go through all this suffering? But in the end, provided we hang on, we'll get to the end of the tunnel. So this is faith, isn't it? This is faith. That's the point, isn't it? No matter what the difficulty, just hanging on to the rope. 
in another Gosho to Mio Ichiyama, the same lady, Nichiren Daishonin said, as a woman cherishes her husband, as a man will give his life for his wife, as parents will not abandon their children, or as a child refuses to leave his mother, so should we put our trust in the Lotus Sutra, Shakyamuni, Taho, and all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas of the Ten Directions, as well as the heavenly gods and benevolent deities, and chant nam myo ho kyo This is what is meant by faith. So, I hope it's not a bore, but just to give you my own experience, maybe best, this sort of situation, many of you, I'm sure, have experienced similar situations, or you're experiencing them now, or you're going to experience them in the future. So when I returned from Japan, uh, I had no work. I thought, I spent a year when I was in Japan, my last year, negotiating a job for myself in this country. But in the way of life, two days before we flew back, uh, the whole arrangement collapsed because of a business crisis. And I arrived in this country with nothing much except a bit of savings and the Gohonzon and Mitsuko. <laughs> so, I went into partnership in a small company and put the last of my savings into it. And everything was okay at first. But after a little while, my partners, there were two partners, one was active, uh, working all the time, the other one just appeared at intervals. And uh, I realized after a bit that somehow or other, my ways of looking at everything were always totally different to theirs. Of course, they weren't practicing, I was. And the active partner, who was younger than me, was rather a sort of pessimistic sort of chap. And uh, he also in, in inwardly panicked a lot. And uh, he didn't have too easy a life himself, especially uh, he had rather a difficult, what we call, financial karma. He knew I was a Buddhist, and he knew I was very active. He knew that when work ended, I was off in my car to London to do activities. And after a bit, he really began to, I suppose, it's not using too much word, to despise me. He hated the very word Buddhism. And he made life as difficult as it could possibly be for me. I'd never been through such an experience before. And it was miserable as a result, because every day uh, there was difficulties, arguments, anger, him expressing sort of bitter feelings and so on. It was really ghastly. And added to that, <coughs> that particular point in time, which was probably one of the reasons uh, we were going through a difficult time. Business-wise, it was a struggle. But what made him really mad was that somehow or other I always seemed to be proving that my view was right. And of course I was chanting about every step of the way. I wanted this company to be successful so that I had a bit of money for Mitsuko and I to live on. And always he was being proved wrong and I was being proved right. And in the end, he gets so sick of me that in a fit of great anger uh, behind my back when I was away one day, he moved my office out of the main building and put it in the warehouse. <laughs> so there I was in this dusty cell, <laughs> sort of exiled. <laughs> I suppose that warehouse was my sort of Sado Island. And sometimes, uh, really, I was in despair. It was ghastly. But for various reasons, although I tried to fight back in various ways, uh, he made such an awful scene that for peace and quiet, I thought, well, stick it out. So this was a very different situation to my business life in Japan, I don't mind telling you, where I was managing director of a group of companies. And 
it was very, very different to my work before that, when I was in Harrods and had a great big office with a sort of ornate desk in it. <laughs> and uh, uh, it was very different <laughs> to all my experiences in the army. Uh, amazing. But of course, later I realized it had done me lots of good. It had certainly polished off a lot of sharp corners in my life, that experience. And also, uh, any vestige of pride, stupid pride that I might have had, disappeared during those uh, miserable months. Because it went on for about 18 months, this. <coughs> my only bright light was activities. So it was, you know, a great thing. At the end of each day, I could get into my car and go dashing off to somewhere in London where I could meet bright, joyful members, uh, all of whom, though, were struggling in their own particular way, too. So, of course, I went through a period. It, as I say, this lasted for 18 months, this situation. And I did get desperate at times. I did start, you know, this awful business of saying, you know, what, maybe my face's all wrong, maybe I'm practicing in the wrong, wrong way. I went through the whole list of sort of things that you start wondering about what had gone wrong. And even, I suppose, once or twice, though I don't remember it too often, I suppose once or twice I may have thought, you know, does this, is this Gonson really working? But actually, I, I don't think I did think that because all the way through that period, although that situation was so ghastly, uh, there were other lesser benefits popping up every so often, don't they? Just to keep us going, just to make us realize that we're not forgotten. Sometimes I think when you practice to the gods and it is like a, a sort of underground lake of good fortune that's gradually welling up slowly in our lives and every so often it sends up a little fountain or rather like a spring on a hillside with pure water uh, of some benefit that gives one hope again. So you've, many of you have been through it all. You know what I'm talking about. So because of that, of course, and because I suppose of one's faith, Somehow, you know, you just hang on to the rope. There was no other way. And I felt deep in my life that somehow or other I would get through it. Somehow or other I could see this sort of rather dim-looking glimmer of something, a little bit gold-looking, you know, at the end of this long tunnel or through this fog that I was caught in. And so I hung on for that whole 18 months. And, of course, in the end, uh, there being no deadlock, no stalemate in this Buddhism, I broke through into the brilliant sunlight. And the brilliant sunlight uh, was, in fact, uh, uh, that uh, President Keda asked me if I would be uh, full-time uh, work for Buddhism. This was incredible. Uh, something that I'd hardly ever dared to think of. I wanted to do it so much. Uh, that happened in 1977. So uh, that was the sunlight for me, and I'm happy to say I've been living in it ever since. So my point of telling that story is, you know, we just have to hang on, don't we? If any of you haven't yet experienced this, and of course not everyone has to experience it, it depends, but if any of you haven't and you find yourself in such a situation, just hang on. No matter what, you must hang on and not give up, because in the end, definitely, you'll break through into the sunlight. Winter has to turn into spring, as Nichiren Daishonin said. Winter can't be winter all the time. Spring always comes. And never, as he says, has he known winter jump over spring and summer and turn into autumn. It's just not in the nature of life or in the nature of this practice in Buddhism. There are many other extracts from the Gosho Antha which encourage us in other ways. Don't stop on the 11th day of that famous journey uh, to Kyoto. You will win, in other words. Added to that, of course, you'll learn so much about yourself and do so much human revolution in the process. So, of course, this was my karmic retribution. Something, you know, in my life, whether in this life or past life, I'd made the causes to suffer in that way. And I'd earned it. I had to go through it. And through it, uh, I could come out the other end a stronger person with my life much cleaner 
and much more pure. So I'm going to ask, just to remind you of this, I'm going to ask Joe to read three short extracts from The Opening of the Eyes, which is in volume two of the major writings. The Hatsunaino Sutra states, Men of devout faith, because you committed countless offenses and accumulated much evil karma in the past, you must expect to suffer retribution for everything you have done. Some of these grave offenses I have already paid for, but there must be some that are not paid for yet. Even if I seem to have paid for them all, there are still ill effects that remain. When the time comes for me to transcend the sufferings of birth and death and attain Buddhahood, it will be only after I have completely freed myself from these grave offenses. My merits are insignificant, but these offenses are grave. When iron is heated, if it is not strenuously forged, the impurities in it will not become apparent. Only when it is subjected to the tempering process again and again will the flaws appear. So this Gosho, as you know, was used during summer course, and as you may have heard, the men's division uh, decided that their sort of, uh, what's the word, mascot, ought to be an anvil uh, and a hammer. Because that is where the arm is hammered, isn't it, again and again. That is to say, it is through sufferings like this that we eventually bring ourselves to enlightenment. Without sufferings, we would never do that. It's only because we're in a jam, because we're in difficulties, that we practice strongly. If there were no sufferings, would we practice every day? No. <laughs> Definitely not. Hmm? Definitely not. We've become complacent and useless. So all things in this universe are going through the same thing. Everything. And we see it, of course, clearly in nature. Everything has to go through suffering. And the great example, of course, is trees and plants, which have such a struggle to grow, to push out their roots, to get water. They put out a bud and it's bitten off by the frost. It's hard and tough, but through that growing process, they become beautiful and strong. Hothouse plants are useless, aren't they, often? You know, they, uh, one spends a lot of time in a hothouse digging away and planting tomato plants. But if you keep it too hot, you know, a tomato plant will produce one great big hothouse tomato <laughs> and then collapse. <laughs> That's no good, is it? So we have to go through these difficulties. Hands up, honestly, who's going through some sort of a period rather like that experience that I was giving. Whoa! <laughs> Congratulations! <laughs> That's fantastic. I'm very honest of you. Anyway, really seriously, don't uh, have any doubt. You just hang on. Maybe that ought to be the motto of the youth division. Just hang on <laughs> to that rope which is chanting nam myoho renge to the gods. There is no stalemate, there is no deadlock. You will definitely break through, come out at the end of the tunnel into the sunlight. You need have no doubts. So, uh, from this moment, try hard, you know, not to have any more doubts. Just keep going. So now we'll go on with the Gosha. I just want to consider two paragraphs in it. And the first one is paragraph number two, the second paragraph. Okay, Joe, can you, Joe, read it. At the end of his life, the Lord Buddha lamented, Now I am about to enter Nirvana. The only thing troubling my heart is King Ajatashatru. Bodhisattva Kashyapa then asked him, Since the Buddha's mercy is impartial, your regret in dying should stem from compassion for all mankind. Why do you single out King Ajatashatru? The Buddha replied, 
Suppose that a couple has seven children, one of whom falls ill. Although the parents love all their children equally, they worry most about the sick child. So this is very relevant to what we've just been talking about, isn't it? We go through these periods of suffering because our <coughs> karma has brought this upon us. Some where in our past we made the causes. However, if we keep going, if we hang on to the rope, if we never give in, we will always break through. And to my way of thinking it, you know, this paragraph which Joe's just read applies there. Not only will we always break through, but we also realize after a bit that the Khonsan is protecting us all the time. Actually, even though we seem to be on the brink of disaster every so often during that period of struggle, always the Gonson protects us. It's proof, isn't it? It's proof that we're practicing the true law and it's proof that we've got to go through such periods. So I know most of you, all of you probably, who've had your hands up a little while ago, know You've had the proof, in small ways mostly, that the Gonsan is protecting one all the time. So the Buddha Shakyamuni, of course, represented and was one with the law of Nam Myoho The Buddha's concern was not with everybody who was healthy and going fine. The Buddha's greatest concern was with King Ajatashatra, who had murdered his father. His past was terrible. But as the Buddha said, if I can save this man, then Buddhism will save everybody. And of course, as the story goes, King Ajatashatru uh, embraced Buddhism. Instead of dying within seven days, I think it was, or four days, uh, he didn't. He lived for another 40 years. And he, in fact, he was the person responsible for organizing uh, the first council which began to record the Buddha's teachings after he died. So uh, it's a great story, but it is also emphasizing that no matter what, the Buddha or Buddhahood will always protect us, no matter what difficulties we may be going through. So uh, if that's clear to everybody, we'll go on to another paragraph over the page. And this is now a different subject we move on to, the eternity of life. Your husband gave his life for the Lotus Sutra. His entire livelihood depended on a small fief, and that was confiscated because of his faith. Surely that equaled giving his life for the Lotus Sutra. Sesson Doji offered his life for but half a stanza of a Buddhist teaching, and Bodhisattva Yakyo burned his elbows in offering to the Buddha. They were both saints, so they could endure these austerities as easily as water pours on fire. But your husband was a common mortal, so he was at the mercy of his sufferings, like paper placed in fire. Therefore, he will certainly receive blessings as great as theirs. He may be watching his wife and children in the mirrors of the sun and moon every moment of the day and night, since you and your children are common mortals, you cannot see or hear him, but neither can the deaf hear thunder nor the blind see the sun. But do not doubt that he is close at hand protecting you. Can't you imagine how incredibly moved this rather frail lady in the midst of her difficulties, looking after a sick son, uh, having lost her husband, can't you imagine how she must have felt when she began to read this. And I guess she read it over and over again like we have to read it over and over again in order to really understand its deep meaning. And this lady, of course, in her gratitude, uh, had sent a robe in this case, and it was Nichiren Daishonin's gratitude, in turn, who wrote back to her to thank her for the robe and give her this great encouragement and guidance, as he did to so many others. On another occasion, when he was in exile on Sado, as you discovered, she actually sent her servant 
to look after him for a time and protect him. So much was she grateful to Nichiren Daishonin. So this passage, as I said, is concerned with the eternity of life. And that's the great question tonight. Do you understand that life is eternal? Not just theoretically, here. Do you feel with your whole life that it's true, life is eternal? I'm sure many of you do not. Some do, and that is nothing to be ashamed of, because it's a concept that we were not brought up with. It's something that we have to master ourselves. But we read about it, don't we, constantly in the Gosha or in President Kedah's guidance. It's always turning up this matter of the eternity of life. Do I believe it with my whole life? Or is it only just a theoretical thing that, yes, very logical, life must be eternal? That's not enough, is it? We have to live the fact that life is eternal and that our life, what is more, is eternal. We celebrate it every day in Gongyo. Gongyo about, is about the eternity of life. Gongyo is an eternal ceremony, isn't it? In Gongyo, uh, the fifth prayer emphasizes the fact that we're in communication, <coughs> not just uh, with everything living in the universe, the sun and the moon and the stars, everything. But we're also in communication with everything that is in its unseen or latent state. That is to say, in what we call ku. That state uh, of sort of suspended animation, which we call death. And as you know, uh, the Buddhist teaching is that we go through this cycle of life and death. And death is of supreme importance because our physical body, our physical shell, inevitably, because it's physical, must deteriorate until it becomes inefficient and sort of painful to carry around with us. We can't function like our, 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 our spirit would like us to function. It has to be replaced. And that's the purpose of death. We discard that shell and generate the power or life force to take on a new one. Life is eternal. Our life goes on. You cannot destroy life. You could swipe around with a baseball bat uh, in the air and you wouldn't destroy anything unless a wasp or a bee or a fly got in the way. But otherwise, you're not going to destroy life, are you? So, uh, this is this a reality? This is the thing. This is really, really what I want you to ask yourselves tonight. Is it a reality that life is eternal? Or am I just glossing it over as a theoretical understanding? Maybe many of us do. Because many of us, it's so ingrained and so habitual to be frightened of death that we can't bring ourselves to consider it deeply. Or even to chant about it strongly. We might have a try, but we'll stop. Because still, this is because of habit, habitual way of thinking based on wrong teachings. Still, inside of us is this fear of death. So, Buddhism is saying, Nichiren Daishonin is saying, we must challenge it. It's important for our whole lives and our happiness that we challenge it. If the fear of death, the unknown quantity of death, is of concern to us, it is probably of concern very, very deep down. Not near the surface of life necessarily at all. But because it's there deep down, it has a profound effect on the way we look at everything in life, on the way we look at our own function in life, and it can cause a very deep 
unhappy disturbance within each one of our lives. Though this is why I'm saying tonight, if we're true to Nishan Daishonin's teachings, if we truly are his followers and we don't face the